So, um, morning everyone, uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, bit of a tongue-in-cheek title, can DIC save your PhD? But hopefully there's a, a little bit of logic around it. We've already had some great presentations this morning um, which did utilise um, DIC already, so I won't go too much in depth to how it works. Um, but thanks for the introduction. I guess I can skip this slide now, but my name's Amy. Um, I work as a application sales engineer for testing products at GOM UK, and I've just included my email address there because anyone, anyone who's on the call would be welcome to email me if they have any questions on how to use um, any GOM products or if they've got any applications they want a, a bit of help or advice with, they're welcome to email me. Uh, so I've included my email address there. Okay, so quick agenda. I'll Firstly, I'll introduce GOM, um, and then we'll talk about what potential current measurement issues uh, you could be having, what DIC is and how it how does it work. And then I'll do a very quick uh, software demonstration, uh, do a 2D strain analysis with within the GOM Correlate software. I'll share a couple of 2D application examples, but then we'll talk about where the limits are for 2D DIC. Um, and I've got a couple of like, fun um, 3D application examples too, but a few are genuinely from or have stemmed from PhD projects. So hopefully that's um, interesting. Okay, so GOM is an optical 3D metrology company. Um, everything GOM does is based around using cameras to measure things. Um, a little quick tour of our UK office. I made this slide back in April and um, with the help of a colleague and it's honestly been very, very useful um, as we're not allowed too many visitors at once. So this sh shows our, our product range. At the top, we've got the Atos system, so top uh, left is the Atos system. This is a 3D scanning system, so we can create four 3D meshes of objects, uh, small and large. On the top right, we've got the scan boxes. So this is um, basically putting an Atos system on a robot and getting the robot to do all of the work for you. And then bottom left, we've got the Aramis SRX. So this is our high-end Aramis uh, digital image correlation system. Uh, the Aramis SRX can go up to 2000 Hertz um, and has 12 megabytes of resolution. Uh, so this is really top of the range um, as a full packaged uh, Aramis system. And then bottom right, we've got sort of a new in GOM's portfolio is the GOM um, CT scanner. It's really designed to be a metrology CT scanner. So as opposed to just looking for like voids and different um, material boundaries, we're really looking at measuring a part that can be then be compared to a CAD model with this. Uh, this will be rebranded now. GOM is a part of Zeiss. This will be rebranded as a as a Zeiss CT to sort of slot into their range. So this isn't an extensive list, but this is just sort of a couple of ideas I came up with um, very quickly earlier. So if you're having any of these issues, so for example, strain gauges becoming unbodied from your sample, um, lightweight samples, so you can't even really apply strain gauges or extensometers. Um, you've got high temperature measurements, but you don't have any sort of high temperature equipment in the lab, or you're not getting enough information from a single point or just sort of global measurements, um, but you've got an FEA model that you need to validate. Maybe DIC can help out. And then, of course, if your supervisor doesn't have the budget to buy a fancy piece of equipment, um, I think this is where um, DIC, specifically um, the free GOM software, can really help people out. So what is a digital image correlation? I think probably most people already know this, um, but just in case you don't, the sort of the GOM definition of it is digital image correlation or DIC is an optical method to measure 2D and 3D coordinates based on stochastic patterns. So within the GOM software, it is actually possible to measure point markers and stochastic high contrast patterns, but I thought we would just focus on, on the right hand side for today. So the just a quick breakdown of how we do that. We take the image information. So we capture images of sort of the start of the test and then keep capturing images throughout the test. Um, ideally, the part is deformed in some way. And then the software breaks these images down into facets and then correlates the images throughout the test. The software then will calculate the 2D coordinates of the pre and post deformed um, images, and then it can use these coordinates to calculate the strain. So very, very quick explanation there. So what does an ideal setup look like? 
Ideally, you've got a camera with a lens and it's looking at a sample. So the for a 2D measurement, this camera needs to be perfectly perpendicular to our sample. Our sample needs to be flat and the deformation of the sample needs to be in the um, direction perpendicular to the camera. So what does this sort of setup look like? Um, this is the setup I have at home. Yeah, I do DIC uh, in my living room every time I do a training course. Uh, we do a very, very quick DIC measurement. So in this example, I've got a 3D camera. Uh, sorry, a 3D, a USB 3 camera, it's a very much a 2D system. Um, I've got a fixed focal length lens where it's got these um, locking, um, locking screws so I can lock the focus so that doesn't change in the middle of a test or test to test. And then I can change the arbiter and that can be locked as well. This is then mounted on this rig so it's always perfectly perpendicular to my sample. Uh, this is just a simple rubber tensile test with a speckle pattern. But because the part's rubber, I can deform it very easily with this small plastic handle. But of course, um, most of the time you'd want like a proper test machine um, to deform the sample. OK. So let's have a look at the software and how this looks when we do it within the GOM software. Uh, I did want to show you how to import the images, but I don't have these. Um, images as raw images actually, uh, but it's very simple. You capture the images um, with whatever image acquisition method you want, be it a video or um, images. Ideally you would have PNGs but JPEGs and that will work as well. And then ideally your images are black and white and you've got a nice speckle pattern as well as um, a some sort of system of scaling your images as well. OK, so this is a brand new project. I've not done any analysis on it. All I've done is uh, we've got the images. So within the GOM software, we're just going to work left to right through this colored toolbar um, until we've got the results that we want. So first we need to define the scale. The software doesn't know how big each of these pixels are because we've just imported the images. So it doesn't know if this is two millimeters large or 40 or 400. So let's define a scale. And we've got this ruler, which of course has to be in the same plane as the sample to help us define the scale. If you know the thickness of your sample or the width of your sample, you can use that as well. Um, so I'm going to click on two points, apply um, 40 millimeters between the two points. And now the software knows the scale of the images and will assume the same scale. It is possible to scale each image individually. Um, but that's not going to give you the most uh, accurate results. The next step is to define the components. So we're going to ask the software to have a look and define um, some facets. So the facets are these green uh, squares. And each of these facets will have its own fingerprint because of the stochastic pattern or the random pattern that's been applied with a spray can with spray paint. The each box here will have its own pattern and this is what's going to then be matched uh, image to image. So this is what the software is going to be using to do the um, correlation. Within our software we always recommend that you draw a boundary around the part that you're interested in measuring. Uh, this way the, the software can just focus on the area that you want to measure and not try and measure the ruler, especially with 2D measurements, the software can sort of see quite a lot of areas that perhaps aren't, um, perhaps you're not intending to measure, um, but of course you just want to focus on your sample. So now we can see uh, the sample, it's nice beautiful flat sample of course because this is a 2D measurement. Even if the sample is not really flat in real life, the software is going to think it's flat, which is one of the issues where you could get errors coming in. But So when I press create and close, the software takes the uh, 2D facets from the first stage and then continues to match those all the way through the stages. This project just has 40 stages. Of course, perhaps you've got a lot more stages um, in whatever you want to measure. But this is just a nice simple deformation. So I'll just click and drag through the stages so we can see how the part deforms and also notice how the, um, 
how the surface component deforms uh, and the mesh of the surface component deforms with the um, images as well. So that's how the mesh structure looks too. Um, the facets, each of the, these nodes where all these parts um, sort of meet, there's one facet for each of those. And then within the GOM software, we're using sort of a hexagonal triangular um, pattern to distribute the facets, which means that we got this sort of hexagonal pattern to use to calculate the strains, which is a lot more uh, stable than using the square, the traditional squares that we used to use back in 2014 or so. Okay, so the next step, we're going to continue going through the colored toolbar. The software's got some suggestions for things we might want to see on the surface. Let's just uh, keep it simple. We'll check for major, so you can see um, the major strain better. And I can just select any stage in the, um, in the timeline down here at the bottom, and I can see the strain results for this stage. If I'm particularly interested in a specific area, I can use this icon to apply some deviation labels. Let's apply one here, one in the bulk material and one sort of on each side. So of course we've got higher levels of strain each side of the hole um, because this is where the sort of, we've got the um, strain build up. Once I've applied these points, we can, we get all these points automatically plotted in diagrams for us. Um, so we can then use the diagram to navigate. Okay, here I've got my highest strain. Let's see what that looks like on the colored plot. Of course, as I said before, this sample is, is made of rubber. So we've got relatively high strains um, being reached quite easily here. So about 35% right next to the hole. At this point, we might be happy with our results and we might be ready to share them with our colleagues. Either we could save this project and send the project to them because they can also download the free GOM Correlate or we can create a report page. So using this icon here, I can create a report page. I've got different styles, different layouts I can pick from and we can decide whether we want it to be um, a video or a static image. So perhaps we just want to share this single static image because um, this is sort of the point of maximum defamation, or we can share the whole video as well. We would give our report page a title, major strain. Um, and very simply, we've created a report page that we can then share with um, colleagues by uh, a few different methods. So we can export the report page as a PDF, uh, the pages and image and if it was a video we'd have video options here as well so we can export this report page as a video to put into our presentations for example or we can export just the video so very very quick demonstration of how um, com correlate software works and um, but of course there are lots of other things we can do within the software i just don't have time to show you everything today Okay, so jumping back into the presentation, uh, I've got some some application examples uh, to talk through. This is like a sort of a, a, a very small selection of the different uh, material tests that can be sort of DIC can be utilized for. Um, but I just want to look at some specific applications that kind of look at and answer the questions we asked at the start of the presentation. So here we can look at a shear test here we're looking at major strain. The issue with shear testing is the samples do tend to be quite small and we have very inhomogeneous uh, strain across the sample and the like the maximum strain does tend to be in this very specific um, location. So this is a sheet metal sample being tested to the ASTM uh, guidelines. So we can look at both the major strain but also we can use the software to calculate shear angle for us. Um, so from these results, there's about 60% shear angle. So very difficult to measure this sample in any other way, but possible to measure it as a 2D sample, as it's a small flat sample that's just gonna move um, pretty much perpendicular to the camera. Going to sort of the opposite end of the scale here, we're looking at a civil engineering application. So here we've got a concrete um, support that's under sort of a three point bending test. Um, one of the things with concrete is you can't really predict how or where it's going to crack. So ideally you need a 
full field measurement um, process to measure it because you wouldn't know where to apply your strain gauges or your sensors. Sorry, I've got a new mouse and it's super keen <laughs> to move to the next slide. So this is um, a, a good example of where the full field data is really going to help us out here. Um, so if I just play the video again, the the parts that sort of turn red, so experience the higher levels of strain, this is sort of almost predicting where the part's going to crack. Um, and then we can see what it does crack. It does crack along this line here. So almost the first part in the sample to um, experience any amount of strain. But of course, because concrete is an inhomogeneous material, it's very hard to predict where this is going to happen in such a test. Okay, so quick comparison between 2D and 3D. So for 2D, you just need one camera, but the camera has to be perpendicular to the sample. For 3D, we need to have two cameras. These two cameras are at a specific set angle. We need to perform a calibration of these two cameras, but then we can measure our parts moving in any direction and the part can be a 3D part as well. So sort of a, a table that explains the main sort of, almost the main uh, benefits of 3D image acquisition over 2D. Uh, for me, it's that you can have faith in your data. You don't have to worry about the fact that your sample may have moved a little bit uh, forwards and backwards during the test. Test machines aren't perfect, unless you've got an instrument, of course. Uh, test machines aren't perfect. They don't always pull in exactly the um, specific direction. So, and uh, parts thin as well. So it's very rare you have a perfect 2D test and that's where the benefits of 3D acquisition come in too. So a couple of examples of this. Here we've got a tensile test in a climate chamber. Um, this is uh, quite an old example to be honest but it's a really good one because the customer, well first they said that we could share the results which is always nice but also they attached the uh, sensor to the door of the tensile test chamber. So it's always looking in um, at the sample. The part being measured is magnesium. It was measured at 300% um, strain. And essentially the part gets measured at 300 degrees, sorry. And it uh, forms a very small neck, but it's very hard to predict where this neck's going to be. So using DIC, we can just do a full field measurement and then we can see where the uh, necking occurs because we're looking at the whole um, sample. Of course, because of the level of necking and thinning, this isn't a, three, a 2D sample anymore. This is very much a 3D sample by the end of the test. Um, and these are the results sort of in the final image before failure. Okay, and then a few others. So um, at Loughborough, they do a lot of work in the um, in the labs there looking at sports equipment and sort of the development of sports equipment and one of the PhD projects they've had in sort of the past years has been um, in conjunction with Adidas using DIC to basically um, look at feet, look at how people's feet move. I didn't include those slides because I thought some people might appreciate them but then doing these same measurements on, um, on the actual trainers themselves um, and their goal here was essentially to fine trainers that performed like a glove round your foot instead of um, instead of deforming like this so you've got a huge amount of strain um, in just one specific area and when Adidas did release the trainers that were the result of all of this research they released a special ed edition uh, Aramis um, Adidas Alpha Bounce that you can Google and buy on eBay for like 200 euros now. Um, unfortunately all of the copies that GOM got were in size nine and I'm a five, so I never got to wear them. Okay, and then another example, here we've got um, an example of where someone wanted to validate an FEA model as well as produce a, a cool bit of marketing material. Again, a project with Adidas, we're looking at um, a compression top. The FEA model is this one here on the right. So they had this FEA model and the only way really to validate this and to measure how this, um, if this is what they were really getting in real life, is to perform DIC. So this is um, underformed, so not on a person. And then um, when it's positioned, positioned, worn by a person, um, the compression and how that compression works um, on an athlete. So a couple of examples um, of 2D and 3D DIC. 
So this is the list of issues we talked about at the start. The only one I've not really covered yet is if your supervisor doesn't have you the budget. So the solution to this is to download the free GOM Correlate software. Because it's uh, free, you can try it out and perhaps you can prove that DIC is going to help you um, just to help get some budget as well behind it. So a little bit more information about the GOM Correlate software. You can, well, most importantly, you can download it um, from this link here. Um, it's free evaluation software, so you can import videos and images to do free 2D analysis. But also if you know someone who's producing 3D projects with um, a GOM system, you can use it to um, look at their results as well. So it's a way of sharing the results too. Um, next year, I've already planned in about three dates uh, before the end of April to do free online training sessions. So people would be welcome to join in on those. Uh, a little bit more information if you did want to uh, learn a bit more about how the GOM Correlate software works. We do have some tutorial videos on our training center at training.gom.com um, and we you can also register at the GOM service area where there's some information and a forum as well that no one hangs out in but anyway. <laughs> okay so I've not been I wasn't sure if I should expect any questions but if anyone does have any questions they're welcome to ask or um, of course you've got my email address so you'd be welcome to email me as well. Thank you very much Amy. Um, this is a really cool presentation. I think it's really nice to see some more fun applications of DIC than just uh, composite tests. That's what I do. <laughs> I, I cut out the composite <laughs> tests, so I'm glad I did now. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah, leave the I NASA think... one in because I think that's not very relevant for people's PhDs, whereas at Loughborough it really is sort of PhD students who are measuring this sort of level of things. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting like how many applications you can find for this type of just image monitoring um, applications. But um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for Amy? Um, I didn't see any in the chat. I have a question. Yep. Yep, uh, because I dealt with uh, DIC during my PhD and uh, I know that DIC is quite effective at room temperature at uh, not so high temperature. Uh, I dealt with DIC when I uh, when I wanted to test the titanium in the temperatures up to 900. So yeah. actually at temperature of 700, the, the, the sample just start to shine and then DIC just, you know, failed to, to work. Uh, do you guys have any, any I don't know, lubricants or, or spray that, that uh, actually we can use to cover the sample to, to get the patterns and uh, to, to further, yeah. Yeah, Indeed. so we have a few different ideas um, and sort of <coughs> solutions for this. It really depends on the application, uh, but we've successfully measured things up to 1200 and even 1600 degrees. Oh. Um, so the thing, when your sample starts to shine, do you mean it starts to glow from the temperature? Yeah, yeah, yeah so... Yeah. A uh, GOM solution for that is kind of, you've got to apply sort of a multi-pronged attack for this because it the glowing is is pretty difficult. Um, we, we use polarized light um, with blue light filters to sort of try and help reduce that glow. And then also we just use more light. The more light you're providing to use for your DIC, the less the glowing is going to affect things. And then of course we have sort of a couple of different um, high temperature paints and powders to test. Um, but again, every, every, every test is different. Um, so we've sort of got like a table from different experience, <laughs> shall we say, of this engineer in Germany measured titanium at 700. He used this powder and that powder and, and it right. works. So I can try that for your application. Maybe it doesn't work because it's different, but yeah, there is a... Is it available somewhere in the website or? Um, no, this is a sort of a for the distributors only, but um, all right. Yeah, so I need to pay for that, right? <laughs> well, well, no, but we've got sort of a wealth of information for distributors only that we obviously yeah, want to make sure. public to everyone. <laughs> um, but of course, if you're a GOM customer, you can buy high temperature powder from GOM, which has been proved on specific applications. Yeah, I do have DIC in my institute, and uh, I'm currently use it. 
Yep, uh, I'll give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, are there any further questions? Uh, yeah, I might have two quick questions. Uh, <laughs> the first one is, how does the Aramis algorithm compare to Davis or the Aviso algorithms? Uh, and the second one is, I've seen you, so you have a new CT scanner. Yep. I was wondering if you were also proposing a CT, a digital volume correlation with that together with the scanner. Um, so I'll answer the CT question first. Um, I'll be honest, no, we're not planning that um, at the moment because GOM really focuses on sort of bringing this sorts of technologies to industry. And for us, we as a company kind of don't really see digital volume cor correlation as an industrial solution at the moment. Our DIC systems are essentially very specifically designed to be what used in indus industrial applications. Of course, people use them at universities. For example, Imperial have a 3D camera. One of their master students dropped it and it still worked fine, which is not something you can normally say of a DIC camera because of the extra protection we put on the cameras for industrial applications. Um, so just to go back to your first question, what are the sort of the differences? Well, the the first one, I I obviously can't really speak for everyone else's algorithms, but I I think that at the moment GOM are the only ones who use the hexagonal, the hexagonal distribution of facets, which not only means that we can have um, much cleaner um, results around holes and get a lot closer to the hole. Uh, just bring back the image there. We can get sort of this nice sort of pattern around the hole. Of course, I just did this uh, quickly, but we can sort of move and change our facets around uh, instead of having these sort of square patterns around holes, I want to say. Um, and it also gives us a much more stable um, structure for calculating strain. Um, so I think this is the, the main difference that I can talk about, but of course the, within the GOM software you've got the option to have a couple of different fitting algorithms. So, um, you know, there's, you've got parameters that you can change there as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any, any more questions? Okay, well, in that case, um, I'd like to thank you again, Amy, for joining us today and for giving this presentation. Um, I hope that it's given some of our um, delegates some food for thought if they hadn't considered using DIC before, or perhaps they're going to have a go at using the GOM Correlate software. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I encourage it. It's, yeah. um, it's, uh, it's, quite, it's very easy to use. It's quite fun too, so <laughs> I highly encourage it. Just uh, one, yeah. one, one okay. final, if I could just ask one, one final question to yeah. Amy. I'm just, just wondering about where is the bulk of GOM's business? Um, like is it aerospace, is it automotive? Uh, would the universities be a small part of it? Yeah, so for, for GOM as a company, obviously we're a worldwide company. The bulk of the business did really start in the automotive industry because we are a German company and we've got very strong sort of links and ties to companies like BMW and Volkswagen um, in Germany. In the UK, it's actually very 50-50. If you look at sort of the business as a whole, not just testing, um, because we've got strong links to Jaguar Land Rover and BMW, but also to Rolls-Royce and um, the research institutes sort of the Rolls-Royce and Airbus and stuff um, support, shall we say. So a lot of like varied, um, but mostly automotive and aerospace with sort of these research institutes that are supporting those. And then probably f just under 50% now um, testing systems are in universities still. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll end the session there. Um, but if anyone does think of any questions, then as before, please feel free to send them to me in an email or a chat or to send them directly to Amy. Um, I can uh, include Amy's email address yep. also when I compile the, the list of delegates. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Uh,